Great. Yeah, as she said, I'm John Horan. I am the oral historian for the State Archives of North Carolina and amateur podcaster turned pro for the archives. Uh, so I'm going to give a little plug here. Check out Connecting the Docs. It's the State Archives podcast. And we're in the midst of our third season where we've explored murder ballads, the journey of an archival record, the true stories behind the fictional account of Where the Crawdad Sings, and other great little stories throughout. Um, but shameless plug aside, I'm glad to be here today for this workshop, to give this talk, and to answer any questions you might have about conducting oral history or working with a state archives. Well, North Carolina State Archives anyway. I can't speak for all 50 states. Um, as for what I do uh, as the state oral historian, I am responsible for gathering and preserving the story of North Carolina as told by North Carolinians with their own voices. I collect oral histories for projects that I create in conjunction with several with the special collections team and the state archivist. But I also collect oral histories from community partners where I may be a consultant uh, or just sort of the conduit from their uh, work to our repository. But we'll get into all that uh, today. But first, I wanted to bring your attention to this photograph. It is the front door to the State Archives of North Carolina in Raleigh, and it is imposing. But I'm here to tell you, in reality, those wide apertures are not meant to keep people out. On the contrary, they are meant to draw in as many people as possible. So today, I thought we could discuss what oral history is, the basics, interview planning, release forms, recording equipment, file preservation, and the actual business of interviewing itself all within an hour. Let's see if we could do it. Well, with that said, let's explore some fundamentals. Oral history, it seems like a straightforward thing. History is what happened. It's the past. Written history is a documentary account of the past, and oral history is a spoken account of that past. In short, it makes a lot of sense. But of course, oral history is much more nuanced than that. Oral history is an extremely complex blend of art and science. The science comes into play in the outline of data collection. When you come up with an oral history project, you are seeking to interview people that can speak to a specific set of themes or issues. In other words, you are collecting data. But it's also very clearly an art, because though you want to collect data points, historical data points as told by various narrators, the art is in the blending of the right group of narrators, because you can't interview everyone all the time. And then within the interview itself, you must be aware of where you want the interview to go, where the narrator wants the interview to go, and how are you going to blend those two expectations. The meshing of your expectations and the person you're interviewing's expectations is a delicate and often overlooked balance within oral history. As I said, history is an account or multiple accounts of the past, but of course it's full of bias and holes. One of the major questions we must always ask ourselves when gathering history, oral history and otherwise, is whose past are we looking at? In the archives, we have vast collections, both digital and in physical holdings, but we don't have everything, that's obvious. And so when you look, holes become evident. So when I sit down and think of a project, I think of how I can do my part to begin the work of filling those holes with the voices of the people. The value with this approach is that I expand collections as well as diversifying the types of collections. Relying solely on written evidence means relying on a certain type of story. At the State Archives, this evidence was generated either by necessity through a government agency and then held on retention schedules or donated by individuals through the special collections. Um, and, and that means they, they generally had time and money to write things down. Certainly, there is a place for written versions of the past, don't get me wrong, but to rely only on them often means to cut out vast quantities of groups and individuals. Oral history represents an entirely different sort of history, a more democratic way of doing history. Instead of exclusively relying on what people wrote, which has its own presumptions, oral historians rely on what people say. These memories can come from anyone and everyone, and that's, but that's not to say that they can't be excluded from the record. Of course, they still can't. But by opening up the archives to allow anyone to share their stories, we get a fuller picture of the past, of our past, and everyday stories become extraordinary stories. Well, so let's back up a little bit. What is oral history? That is one of our original questions at the top. Uh, it is the process of conducting interviews plus all of the knowledge gained and information disseminated from those interviews. So how do we gather oral histories? It's inherently a collaboration. And I'll explain. We have the interviewer or oral historian. This person works alone as a team, works alone or as a team, attempting to create a framework of questions and themes to understand a particular part of our history. 
So as Melissa said, for example, at the State Archives, we are working on a project to gain a greater understanding of how school desegregation and integration developed in North Carolina since Brown versus Board in 1954. We wanted to learn more about the first wave of students who endured integration. You know, I could find photo negatives, newspaper clippings, and information from government agencies. But all of the questions and materials we could put together from the archives wouldn't work without the other party in the creation of an oral history. For the school desegregation and integration project, we wanted to add the voices of those students and administrators and teachers to the official record. So for that project and indeed all oral history, we need interviewees often called a narrator to tell or narrate their story. Everyone has a story, that's clear. People have the memories of what they've observed, what they've been a part of, what they've heard secondhand. Regardless of how the memories occurred, these memories shape perspective and thoughts. And just as an interviewer without a narrator is a person full of questions without any answers, an interviewee without questions to answer can often get lost on tangents. The value of oral history is that it is a collaborative process that helps, helps us answer questions and provide data to understand our past while also giving the individual a place to share and store their memories for others to learn from. So I'd like to get into the body of this discussion by sharing an excerpt from an oral history that I conducted with the former secretary for the Department of Health and Human Services in North Carolina, uh, Dr. Mandy Cohen, conducted in January 2022 for our COVID-19 Government Employee Oral History Project, which I'll share more about later, but first a clip. I was like, we're on our own, guys. Like I said that very early on, I was like, we are on our own. Uh, there, there's, no gonna, there's not going to be a, a cadre of nurses <laughs> that we can go get from another state, which is what we would do in a hurricane, right? Right. A hurricane would strike in North Carolina. We'd been through it before, and we'd reach back. We'd reach over to to Illinois and be like, hey, Illinois, can you? You didn't have a hurricane. Can you send us some nurses? Um, can you send us some ventilators? No, like everyone was on fire, like everyone had a hurricane, right, at the same time. So I was learning the new process of like, oh, how do we get things from the national stockpile? And, <laughs> and oh my gosh, when they send things from the national stockpile, they're all expired and they're all degrading and they're falling apart. Um, you take out your flu pandemic plan and you're like, oh my God, we've already outstripped everything in this plan. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it was a lot of that. That was just like, it was like it was a lot of, oh my God, of, of, you know, and I want to say we had a lot of things going for us in North Carolina and hurricane and our preparedness because of hurricane was one of them. Um, we had a terrific, terrific relationship with emergency management. So good. Um, and it remains really, really good today. So they they were tremendous, and they like they know how to respond to emergencies. Like they knew how to get like stuff from FEMA and blah blah blah. blah, blah. Now the stuff we got wasn't good, and we had to go back to the drawing board. But like they knew how to like start the machine, um, which was really really helpful. <clears throat> so. I often start here because, of course, she's discussing the pandemic and it, it, there's a great nuance and, and, and value added and richness to, this, to the story by hearing what she has to say about ga gathering materials and, and all of this sort of thing that's good for the record. But I also like to talk about it because she talks about the sentiment of having a plan of making sure, you know, maybe you outstrip your flu plan, but you also had other protocols in place to gather things from the national stockpile that that works in disaster preparedness, but why shouldn't it work for oral history? A good, every good project starts with a good plan, and that includes oral history. So talking to folks off the cuff is great for informal events, but it could often lead to a disjointed and difficult to follow oral history. Instead, think about the thing, themes you want to cover. Think about who you know that would have the most to say about the themes you've decided are important. It can be a specific set of individuals or groups. In the case of Dr. Cohen's interview, that project was for a part of history that's obviously still going on. Uh, we've all experienced the COVID-19 pandemic, and so that means we all have a story to share about it. So how did we decide to kind of isolate what stories to, to go after and how to prioritize and all of that? We decided at the State Archives to isolate and capture memories of folks who work for the state and then discuss how their jobs have changed as a result of the pandemic. We wanted to know, know the nuances of that job change. We wanted to know the inflection points within the workplace. In other words, we wanted to know what their new job descriptions were 
informally. We wanted to know what new normals, quote unquote, have, have popped up as the, as the pandemic progressed. We had very specific questions, very specific themes. So that's the first thing I wanna impart in planning and oral history is to be as very as narrow as you can in your focus. And then once you decide on what you wanna talk about and who you think will have the most to say, write it all down and research as much as you can on that history and the individuals you're thinking of talking to. Here's where in general you would decide if you wanna record audio only or video as well. Uh, that may be decided for you depending on your limitations and your, and your uh, uh, project and, and whatever else. And we'll get into technical specs in a moment, but I just wanted to mention that. Another piece of information to think about is, no, is how long you want the interviews to be. I recommend no shorter than 45 minutes and, and certainly not longer than two hours. Um, that's not to say, you know, you want to cut people off, but I would say at the, if you're getting close to a two hour interview, think about rescheduling the second half or third half or third portion or whatever the case may be. Um, just because it gets a little bit tiring after that point. But once you've determined these key points, start reaching out to those individuals you've identified. And then after you've spoken to your first few individuals about doing an interview, here's where the research and clear vision comes in handy. You can speak with people in a pre-interview discussion, orient them on how they might expect the interview to go logistics and content wise. Uh, once you talk to them, you can get a sense of their specific story and you can go back to your research and think about questions that would suit that particular person. In other words, don't forget to tailor your approach. Focus on the research to frame questions. You can have a hard list of questions or, or just go by theme outline. Uh, it just depends on your style. Um, having firm questions uh, uh, can provoke a quiet individual to talk, but can also leave you shut off to potential avenues for follow-up questions. Um, you know, so if you, those are the pros and, there's some pros and cons to both directions. So just kind of figure out what goes for you, striking a balance is part of the fine art of conducting an oral history. Uh, whichever way you do go, I recommend keeping the questions or themes pretty standard across the interviews within a particular project or collection. This way researchers can come in and see consistency across interviews. Um, it allows you to collect sim similar data points through multiple people and reduces the risk of outliers. That is to say, though, once again, don't be too close off the tangents. Uh, don't be too strict with your questions because sometimes hidden gems are given follow in response to follow up questions or trains of thought that the narrator had on their own. Uh, in this latter case, don't be afraid of silence. Um, it may feel awkward. Uh, and I can assure you it does feel awkward in my experience. Um, but what also happens is that awkwardness is felt by the narrator. And just as you're trying to fill the silence, they may also be thinking about filling the silence with more information. So don't be too quick to cut that possibility off. For example, I had an interview for our school integration project where during the interview, during the silence, uh, I just sort of sat there for a little while. I, had, I think I had about a four count in my head for that particular science, silence. Right there in the middle of it, the individual shared that he was a school administrator. It had not come out in our pre-interview chats, nor did it come out in, uh, in my research of him. Um, and he presently was a minister at the, at the time of the interview, so it wasn't obvious there either. Uh, but once he told me that, I turned the discussion from his experience as a student in a segregated situation growing up to his experience trying to integrate schools in the southeastern portion of the state as an administrator. Uh, this is a point I might have missed had I been stuck to a strict list of questions or more, more to the point, afraid of letting the conversation wander. Still playing that balance between data points, getting data points and allowing for the fluidity and nar of narrative storytelling is another one of those things that makes oral history an art form. Now, once you've determined who you're gonna interview and the scope of the interview, it's time to begin the pre-interview process. So I used to begin by talking about digital considerations of file types. Uh, but before you do that, you should consider whether or not you want to do the interview in person or virtually. That's something that we didn't really have to consider. And, and, and I'm sure as you all know, but now we do. Um, at the height of COVID, we did everything virtually. Now we do both. Uh, the benefits of doing it in person are unmatched. It's obvious when compared to con conducting interviews online, you know, body language is more visible. Um, you can get to a level of comfort in person that's a little bit more difficult to achieve in virtually. Uh, 
you know, you don't really have the concern of, of in large meetings, people kind of wandering and checking email and sort of thing, because it's a conversation one on one. So that doesn't really happen. But still, um, there's a level of comfort in person that doesn't really happen, uh, uh, you know, virtually. But there are two points where virtual is preferable. So it's something to think about. The first and, and the sort of the major point, we used to do phone interviews. Now we can do these kinds of interviews, virtual Zoom, you know, Teams, whatever the case may be, because of travel. Distance is a concern. You know, it, it, it can be a barrier for people. With an online interview, they don't have to figure out how to come to the archives or have me in their house to have their story included. I mean, we, in, in the, once again, in the case of the School Desegregation and Integration Project, um, I had a group of individuals whose story was based in Northampton County, a northern county in, in North Carolina, but none of them live there anymore. None of them really lived in the state, and one of them lived in New Zealand. I didn't want to lose her story by saying, hey, you know, I can't, I, I can't figure out a way to get to New Zealand, and you're not coming here, but I'm glad I didn't miss out on her story. I'm glad we did have the virtual option because I was able to understand her experience you know, changing the name of a high school to uh, the mascot of a high school from the rebels to what they change it to for getting rid of the Confederate flag in the gym. All of these things came out in her story. And if I didn't have virtual options, wouldn't have worked. Of course, it was an interview that I did on Monday and she did on Tuesday, but that's a question for time zones. And I can't really get into that here. Now, the next point on why virtual is better than uh, in person is is obvious in the pandemic staying isolated meant lowering your chance of getting sick you know these days COVID is 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 still floating around it's less of a concern um, but there are other communicable diseases you don't have the flu you don't have a cold all of these things especially people in certain you know communities certain vulnerabilities they don't want to be exposed so that's why having a virtual option is always you know nice still though it can overcome distance and kind of make sure people are isolated. Some folks are uncomfortable with technology and prefer to have things done to face to face. So whichever way you choose, and I'm happy to go into more depth with what we did at the State Archives, um, no matter what we do, always make sure you can see the person, even if you're only capturing the audio. You know, like I said, long gone are the days of phone interviews with all of this tech now. So we don't need to do phone interviews. We can see people, we can see their visual cues because visual cues are so important in the making of oral history. Now, leaving that digital physical debate there for, for a second, let's consider the format you'll be recording in. These days, everything is done digitally. There's no reels anymore. There's no you know tapes and, and all of that sort of thing. So we're looking really at two basic file types for audio recording specifically, waves and MP3s. Um, and I suspect you may be familiar with one or both, but I'd like to share that uh, wave is preferred by archivists and oral historians alike. It's best practice because it's a lossless uncompressed format. And what that means is unlike MP3s, which are, which are lossy or compressed files, um, the uncompressed file is less likely to degrade over time. Uh, the, the, the con is, so that's a major pro, the con is that it can take up large amounts of space on your hard drive, depending on if that's a concern for you, you might think about it. Um, it's on the order of 10 times bigger for audio files. So that's just something to be, to be wary of. Um, in addition, when you create these files, you have to, if you create something that started life as, an, as a wave, you can make MP3s from it. But if you created something that started life as an MP3, it cannot be turned into a wave. Just something to keep in mind. Another digital issue to consider is the range of audio which you are capturing. Um, if you can, I would recommend going into the setting of your device with three things in mind. First is a wave. We just talked about it. Second is to make sure your device is set to record at a minimum of 44.1 kilohertz and third 16 bit depth. Uh, of course, in both of those instances, the larger, the better, but the larger means takes up more space. Now the first number 44.1 kilohertz represents the vocal range that's captured in the recording. The larger the range, the higher the pitch and the lower notes that will be recorded. You won't get clipping, um, which sometimes can happen. So that's, that's what that's about. Um, meanwhile, 16-bit depth represents the amount of data per second that's captured. In both cases, like I said, the higher the values are, the more space they'll occupy, but the better the recording will sound and the less likely that the recording will fail over time. So I highly recommend 48 kilohertz and 32-bit if that's an option for you. 
So in addition to, to those digital concerns, you can't ignore the physical needs. In terms of equipment, the easiest way to make a recording is to use something we all carry in our pockets, our cell phones. Smartphones have voice recorder apps and they're great. Voice memo functionality, they can record in WAV format. It's as easy as opening the app and pressing record and beginning the interview. It's quite convenient, but it can result in difficult to understand interviews um, just because the microphones aren't always the best. You know, you put it in the center of the table. So if somebody's sitting a little too far away, if it's turned the wrong way, there's all kinds of concerns. Uh, they can pick up background noise, get, get garbled. That's some, some kind of concern, you know, that you might want to think about. But if you want to conduct higher fidelity recordings or are planning to do several uh, interviews, it may be worth looking into getting external microphones. Uh, they have some that connect to your phone. I'm not really familiar with those, but you can get some that, that connect to your computer directly through an interface through dedicated recording systems. You know, it's all of this stuff. I have an equipment guide that I've prepared and can share um, about buying your own equipment um, that fits a multitude of price ranges and budgets. And, and so there's a lot, you know, that can be can be done on, on a limited budget for sure. Uh, but using my microphone is not the only way to limit external noise. Room selection can be just as important. Uh, room with soft surfaces and a table to set up your recording equipment is ideal. Avoid rooms like the kitchen or the bathroom, although I don't know why you would be in either one of those spaces to record an oral history. I still think I should say it because both are filled with hard reflective surfaces and appliances that have the potential to make their own intrusive noises. Also, don't forget to plan to orient your interviewee. On the day before the interview, I recommend reaching out to your narrator and confirm the, narr the uh, interview. Uh, spend time to inform them uh, of your plan and the progression of the interview. Take note of any stories they share in this discussion before the interview and incorporate them into your narrative plan you know, in advance of the, of the, of the appointed time. Uh, giving this little bit of insight into your plan will allow the interviewee the ability to think about what stories they want to share and put your themes to the front of their mind. So after you've confirmed the interview, set up the room ahead of the interview, have all the recording equipment ready and your questions ready to go, you know, I would, I would, just, would just want to say, make sure I have it all ready to go before they enter the, the, the room. A word of caution, though, don't go too in depth with the pre-interview or you lose the organic quality of an oral history. Um, it is, as I've said, in art form, and this is just another one of those brush strokes that you, you have to be concerned. If you don't, if you tell them too much, they might, you know, have, have prepared too much. It might sound a little too forced, a little too canned. Just be careful. But I will say spending a little bit of time orienting individuals definitely does go a long way. So let's dive into interviewing. You've confirmed the interview, time and space. So the planning is done and it's now time to start interviewing, right? Not quite. We've got to take some time to talk about legal. In oral history, it's often called informed consent and there are a lot reams of articles written about how you should go about setting things up, classes you can take, all of this. So let's not get too bogged down with that at this point. We can talk more about it in the end and then obviously you know, get into some uh, resources. But I do want to talk about some concepts behind the forms. Generally speaking, as I mentioned, in an interview, you have two parties. So when they create, sit down to create the interview, they both hold copyright to the, the finished product. So I want to be clear, they own that version of the story. I mean to say, if it was a physical tape, they would own copyright to that tape and the, that specific version in time. A lot of folks get concerned by this. There's a misconception that if they share the story with us or sign over the, the rights to it to us, they can't share it anywhere and we now own their memory. We now own their story. It's not true. We just own that particular instance. They can wake up the next day and be interviewed by somebody else, tell the basically the same story and it's all good. Um, but our release form has both parties sign to give the rights over of that specific inter iteration to to the state archives. Uh, like I said, the memories will always belong to them, but we do this so that that interview can be included in our collections and publicized for their use. Of course, you should do what's right for your individual uh, projects and organizations and, and all of that sort of thing. So whether it's a release form like one we have or something from Creative Commons or something else entirely, that's just whatever works for you. Just I wanted to make sure I brought this up so you didn't overlook it. Uh, and I'm happy to be a sounding board on, you know, if you have ideas or thoughts or, or concerns, but just, just wanted to make sure I outlined a few uh, of these legal questions when conducting an oral history. 
So back to interviewing, as I continue to say, it is essentially an art form and a conversation. The most important skill to learn is to listen to the individual you're speaking with. In the minutes before you start the interview, chat with the person you'll be interview, interviewing, ease any last minute anxiety, and remember that this is a conversation with, and remind them, this isn't a conversation with an expert, them. No one knows more about the person's you're, you're interviewing life than the person you are interviewing. Remind them of that and give them a reminder that you will be recording the interview and that you have a brief paragraph to, re to read before the questions begin. With all this done, it's time to hit record. Don't forget to hit record. A great many interview has been lost because the interviewer forgot to hit record. So during the interview again, don't forget to hit record. I think I'm making that clear. But once you do hit record, begin with a prepared statement. This is that paragraph I mentioned, explaining what it is you're doing, who you're doing it with, when the interview is taking place, and where it is taking place. I would also argue that standardizing this brief paragraph across all interviews within a project adds even more value to the statement and will allow for people in the future to always have that little bit of context. And it will allow you to use the same introduction, stringing together interviews in time, theme, and space. And as a bonus, you know, if you're alone with, you know, your headphones on your own ear, or if you're working with a partner and they've got the headphones, you know, you can listen to yourself talk and then the responses that the people give, you know, I'm here with so and so and they say who they are and whatever else. Now you can see that both pieces of both microphones are working, the equipment's recording, everything's coming through. So you can get off of boilerplate and into content, you know, without having to restart too much if things aren't going right. So that's just a bonus. You can check the equipment's working. So whether you prepare a list of questions or you like to go by theme or outline, at this point, I, you'll need to lean on your research and your knowledge of the person you're interviewing. But above all, to make sure you are actively listening. Once recording, the interview can take on a fluidity and that fluid nature can bran branch off into a number of different directions. As I've mentioned, following a script too closely and not listening can result in major oversights, both in content of what the person is saying by missing a follow-up or impressing someone too much when their responses clearly indicate that they are uncomfortable with the line of questions. Now, I know I've certainly been in situations where it would have been full of silence if I didn't have questions prepared. So that's something you gotta be, be aware of. That's why I don't recommend flying in off the cuff entirely and having at least an outline, at least some themes. The point is an emphasis on listening is perhaps the greatest lesson to learn about engaging in oral history. It is a collaborative process. It's a conversation and listening to the person you're talking to ensures that you are working with them. And after all, this process is a tool for the narrator in recounting their life. Uh, there's much more to say about the process of actually recording an interview and many have developed techniques and theories on how to conduct oral history and obviously we can chat about this and strategies I employ in the Q&A if we like, um, but I want to just make sure that I get through the whole thing here. Uh, near the end of the interview, I always make sure to ask my narrator uh, or interviewee if they have anything they'd like to add. Uh, I, I always like to remind them that it's their story and, and ask them that they can add whatever they want to their story for this official record. Uh, and then once the interview winds down, I always like to thank them. Don't forget to thank them on the record and then hit stop. And then whew, we can say we're done. We've completed the interview, but we haven't completed the interview process. If you recall to the planning and pre-interview phases, we made a plan to store and use these invaluable oral histories. Here I want to emphasize three pillars that we keep in mind at the State Archives, storage, preservation, and distribution. Conducting the oral history is only part of the battle. If you collect all of the best oral histories in the world, but don't have a mind toward preserving and making them accessible, they aren't worth, worth much. Don't lock them in a drawer. Allow people, researchers, the public, the ability to get access with these interviews. In, distribu in distributing and providing access. Don't forget about storage and preservation either. So while you're thinking about your interviews, themes, narrators, what happens after the interview matters. I recommend partnering with archival institutions like us at the State Archives, but if you can't, in case you can't right away, I will be remiss if I didn't include a few tips on how you might preserve the oral history you already have on an individual level your own personal archives, if you will. 
So first things first, if you can, I hope you recorded your oral histories in that uncompressed wave format. I would make another wave from that wave and then a third copy as an MP3. Uh, because remember, you can't make waves from MP3s, but you can make MP3s from waves. And this way you can store them on multiple drives and, or cloud services or whatever the case may be, um, increasing your self of having a copy. If one drive fails, you'll have the others to back it up. So that's the backups and copies. That's the it's essential in the preservation game. You know, teaming up with an archives, another plug, is, is relieves that burden from you, but still something you might want to do on your own as well. Another piece of advice about is about naming the files. So here's this is uh, so that previously was about storage. This is about preservation. Once you put the interview onto the computer you're working with, you may notice that the recording device has assigned sort of seemingly random numbers to the file. Our particular in-person recording device calls files a Zoom 001, Zoom 002, Zoom 003. As you can tell, it's pretty nonsensical. It's very uninformative and it's completely unhelpful. So I suggest renaming the file as quickly as possible. In the archives, we use the naming convention you can see on your screen. Uh, it gives context and prevents confusion right in the name. And I say, do I, I, I want to make sure that it's in the name and not in the folders, because if you pull 001 out of a folder and put it in a different folder, you lose the connection to its information. So that's something that, to let you to, to keep in mind and keep it kind of brief so that it's kind of quick at a glance to understand what this file is. Um, so in our in this case, it's it's OH stands for oral history. Uh, CoveGov is, is an abbreviated name for our project that this is a part of. It's the third in the list. The name of the individual, the date it was done, and the file type indicates that it's a wave. Um, yeah, it, it, it makes it clear and obvious that this is what this file is, and it's quite straightforward. All of this makes up key pieces of information that help us to identify the file on the back end. It's known as metadata. You know, the file name has the most basic of metadata, but I'd like to show you two forms we use at the archives to keep track of more advanced metadata for our oral histories. We've got this spreadsheet you see here. It has all of our oral histories broken down. This is just a section, by the way. There's many more cells down and there's a few more cells out. Um, it's broken down by project and then aggregated back together. It has information that's often obvious but necessary, like the narrator and interviewer name, uh, but it also has runtime information, where it is in our transcription workflow, um, other key pieces of information, and much more information, uh, summaries, and all that sort of thing. Uh, so then that way we can create finding aids and make it accessible for people to use. Another sheet here uh, that might be more useful for you is, is uh, as, as you do the back end work of your own individual oral histories, it's our creatively named transcription front matter and metadata worksheet. So after we conduct an interview, we fill this form out as, as the interview gets into the transcription queue. We do this so that the interview doesn't have to wait until a transcription is complete before we make it accessible to researchers. Um, it's think of it as like a quick reference sheet. It's got you know the name, the date, what collection it's part of, uh, an interview summary, an interview biography. It's got an index, which is sort of time stamped for important moments in the conversation. That way, you know, we can you know put this up there, and so people can use it and use the oral history um, while it's waiting to get through our backlog of transcripts. Uh, but the, the tips I gave for about file naming convention and metadata sheets and all of that sort of thing, that's for in, immediate information and use for really a truly long term solution. The third time I'll plug it, I want to reemphasize teaming up with a local state or national repository based on your specific project needs and future goals. I will say at the State Archives in North Carolina, we're always interested in helping individual collect and preserve their memories to enhance the memory of the state as a whole. So before we conclude, I would like to share this clip from an interview I conducted with the current Register of Deeds for Durham County. Um, it's not for the COVID project, although it could have been. It is for our school integration project uh, that I mentioned. Her name is Sharon Davis. And we kind of liked, well, kind of really liked where we lived. Like I said, we were all part of this little town called Cleveland, North Carolina. It was a small, you know, knit community and our, um, 
house was very close to the old elementary school. It was like one lot between our house and the elementary school where we went to school for the first to the fourth grade. And that was the old Rosen, we found out later in later years that that was a Rosenwald school that we, uh, you know, had gone to when we were younger. Um, but of course we didn't find that out until well after we had um, graduated. But of course, um, we still have our family home right there too. So that building is still part of our lives because we see it all the time. And it's now being renovated um, to be a community center for the neighborhood. Um, but the school was always there. Um, I laugh and tell people that I can remember before we even started going to school, the interaction between my mother and the teachers in the school, because they knew her because of my older brothers. And um, I can remember vividly one time one of the teachers was out in the yard at the school and she hollered up the street and asked, Miss Avery, do you have any cake? And Mama said, yeah, I got some cake. And there, one of us had to take some cake down to one of the teachers. But, but again, the teachers, we all considered them to be, they were part of our community. Um, some of them went to, you know, some of the same churches that we attended. Um, we always saw them, you know, out at different, you know, events, especially at the school. So this clip illustrates the power of oral history on a number of levels, especially for the project we were conducting, trying to conduct. It's rich just on the surface. She talks about how tight knit the community was. You can hear her voice, the pride that she had in her community and her school. Um, but the extra value that I kind of want to emphasize comes in when you know you, you you hear her say her school is an old Rosenwald school. You know, much has been written and collected about Rosenwald schools. Of course, we can learn what it was called. R.A. Clement, incidentally, when it was closed, or even that it was an old Rosenwald school from documents that the county saved, the school district has, uh, we have at the State Archives, et cetera, et cetera. But without this oral history, we would not have known about the personal connections between teachers and parents, between students and teachers. So we would have lost that tidbit that her teachers would shout in the neighborhood asking parents for baked goods. We find out later on in that interview uh, when she was reassigned to the newly integrated formerly white school that all of the teachers were what white and from another part of the neighborhood. Her parents didn't know them and vice versa. You know, in, in her story, she wasn't even attending the school and her parents knew the teachers enough that they could ask them for baked goods. While she was at, on the contrary, in complete uh, uh, contrast, while she's at the other school, while she's at the other school, her parents and the teachers never met. So listening to this oral hist history opens up a new world of thought. It makes us ask the question, what, not only what was gained during integration, but what was lost as school de desegregated. Without this oral history and taken with others, we miss out on that personal touch that can't be gained through impersonal documents. We take the history that we know and we augment it. We make the everyday extraordinary. So at this point, I 